So doctors, please introduce yourselves. Good morning. Uh, I'm glad to see you shown up for school. It looks like you're in your schoolroom, right? So welcome to Sunday school. <laughs> my name is Dr. Michael Anderson, and I am the uh, in my 16th year of judging these contests. I live in Northern Minnesota, retired professor, retired college administrator, work with Native American kids for a living now. Uh, and Molly? Hi, my name is Molly Russell. I'm an attorney with Legal Aid of West Virginia, and I specialize in domestic violence law. This is my first time judging the national contest. And I'm Ed Philpott. Uh, I'm a trial lawyer in central New Hampshire. Um, I am judging my third uh, national finals competition. And you are? Good morning. I'm Anna Carroll. We're super excited to be here. And I'm a senior at East Kentwood High School. I'm Sam Wakeman. I'm also a senior at East Kentwood High School. And I'm Sam Ramujic. I'm also a senior at East Kentwood High School. And our coach is Mr. Justin Robbins. Okay, let's just take a moment before we start the clock. You're, we're getting a little bit of feedback from you. So your speakers might be a hair loud as they come back to you. And we're, do you hear the loop? Does everyone else hear that? Yes. Okay, so you need to check your vibe. Don't worry, it's, this, is, this happens a lot. So speak again, say your names one more time and see how it works. I'm Anna Carroll. I'm Sam Wakeman. And I'm Sam Ramujic. Yeah, it's a little better, but slightly more would be even better. So. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, it's a, it's a... try it again. Speak your names again. I'm Anna Carroll. I'm Sam Wakeman. And I'm Sam Ramujic. That's better. Is that okay for everyone else? Good. Yeah. Sorry about that. But technology rules our world today. So, all right. Uh, we are going to, we're, I'm certain we're in Michigan and you're the wildcard team. Is that correct? Good. Uh, we're gonna do unit four and here, are you ready to begin? Okay, unit four, how have the values and principles embodied in the constitution shaped American institutions and practices? Question two, members of Congress are not only legislators, but they are quote, also inquisitorial and should meet frequently to inspect the conduct of public officers, unquote. How effectively do you believe Congress has used its investigatory power? Bullet one, explain the differences, if any, between Congress's power to investigate and the power of oversight. Which power, in your opinion, is more significant? Bullet two, how effectively do you believe Congress has used its oversight powers? You may begin. Investigation and oversight are among the least celebrated powers of Congress, but have proven fundamental to the operation of our government. We acknowledge that Congress has at times used investigatory powers effectively, but are disturbed by the infrequent use of this power. In the second treatise, John Locke asserted the first role of the legislative is the preservation of civil society, an idea that James Madison advanced in Federalist 51, describing Congress as the necessarily predominant branch of government. To wield this power effectively, Congress must be empowered to pursue truth and ascertain facts for the American people. For example, as Congress investigated issues related to the Teapot Dome scandal, the Supreme Court established the standard for legislative intent in McGrain v. Daughtry, stating that the power of inquiry with process to enforce it is an essential and appropriate auxiliary to the legislative function. In Barron Blatt v. U.S., the court stated that in inquiry extends over the whole range of national interests concerning which Congress might legislate or decide not to legislate. The scope of this power of inquiry is as penetrating and as far reaching as the potential power to enact and appropriate under the Constitution. This power is often exercised in response to scandal in investigations like the Truman Committee during World War II or following the trail of the Pentagon Papers and the Watergate scandal. Investigations also produced critical information following crises like the 9-11 attacks and the bailout of the banking system in 2008. However, we are discouraged by the recent scale of overtly partisan investigations, such as investigations into Benghazi by seven congressional committees, by three House committees into President Trump's Ukrainian phone call, and two Senate committees into Hunter Biden's Ukrainian ties. The extent of these investigations represents a misallocation of resources and produced no related legislation. While oversight and investigatory powers are in some ways two sides of the same coin, we believe the power of investigation is more significant because it is more wide ranging and produces information necessary to initiate and improve policy. While investigatory powers are more profound, oversight is still essential. 
Oversight powers were historically grounded in the colonial era when the British House of Commons was described by James Wilson as the grand inquisitors of the realm and the proudest ministers trembled at their censures. Today, oversight is performed by standing committees, providing a chance for members to develop more policy expertise, while investigative powers can be exercised by special temporary committees to respond to public demand or current events. We think of oversight as a regular checkup, as opposed to an emergency surgery. Congress has used its oversight powers to some effect, but we believe they have struggled to keep up with the demands of this task. For example, while oversight was used to limit rulemaking of the EPA in the 1980s, Congress has evaluated the FTC's regulation of monopolies in big tech recently without producing a new policy. The major obstacles to more effective oversight and investigation today include deep cuts to congressional staff still felt from the 1990s, recent hesitations by committees to enforce subpoenas, and polarization of the electorate that encourages political theatrics as opposed to virtuous behavior in Congress. These obstacles must be addressed to ensure the fidelity of congressional inquiry. As the Supreme Court recently reaffirmed in Trump v. Mazars, without information, Congress would be shooting in the dark, unable to legislate wisely or effectively. We believe the 2014 example of the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee demonstrates the possibilities. Following an Inspector General Oversight Report and subsequent investigation, new legislation on veterans' health care passed the Senate 93 to 3, demonstrating that bipartisan political priorities can still leverage these powers. It is this commitment to serving the people that must return to prominence. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to your questions. Okay. I want to make sure I understood what you said, so we can be absolutely clear. You used some excellent examples like 9-11, the banking industry, Libya, and the Ukraine. Uh, and then you said that the measure of whether they were successful is whether new laws were passed. Is that correct? Is that what you think? To some extent, that definitely does have an impact on whether or not those investigations are effective. Um, some invest investigations should be based on legislative intent for the most part, but there are also other things that can definitely influence these investigations, such as societal crises, a political haymaking, and even informing the public. Um, and to further Anna's point, uh, while legislative intent is necessary for investigations to occur, Sometimes investigations occur what, uh, purely to see whether legislation is needed. So I wouldn't measure an effective legislation um, or investigation through whether or not legislation was produced, but what, uh, more so how the investigation was conducted. We can see that um, if we use the Benghazi investigation as an example, that was drawn out um, to affect Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. And the extent of that uh, investigation represents um, what I would believe as an ineffective investigation. Moreover, there is some overlap, for example, with the Cujo Committee. Um, this is following the societal crisis of 1907. And with this, um, the Cujo Committee was able to look into a uh, closing house and other things, and it was able to produce legislation of the 16th Amendment, and moreover be able to have some federal centralized banking, at least regionally. Yeah, well, a way to measure the effectiveness of an investigation is if there's legislation passed. It's not the only way. Mm -hmm. well, what's another? Can you say the fact that the Libya investigation produced no outcomes, that somebody was uh, doing something wrong? Isn't that a positive? Yeah, I would definitely agree that that's a positive. Um, and that is one of the reasons that we have an investigation is to make sure that um, there isn't anything corrupt going on. We can use the example of Robert Morris. He was the first congressional investigation occurring. He asked Congress to um, clear his name of any um, rumors that were spreading around him involving the American Revolution and how he financed it. And uh, his name was eventually cleared. And we can use that as a good example of um, an investigation occurring to um, without legislation produced simply to clear someone's name and to prove that nothing corrupt ha happened. So I'm going to piggyback off my colleague's uh, question in that the Ukrainian phone call ended with impeachment proceedings. Is that not a successful investigation? We would say that even though it did end up with impeachment proceedings, there was a legitimate reason for the initial uh, looking into Ukrainian phone call. 
Um, if you believe there's a felony committed on the president's part, there should be an investigation. But the way that the impeachment proceeding was held and the partisan nature of it was definitely a concern and perhaps not the reason why the investigation should have occurred. I would agree that uh, Donald Trump's first impeachment was more similar to a vote, British vote of no confidence than it was to an American impeachment. Um, I believe that the Democratic um, members of Congress were simply looking for reasons to impeach him since 2016, and that the Ukrainian phone call, while the investigation, at first, as Anna mentioned at first, was an appropriate investigation, I believe the extent to which it was taken, impeachment specifically, was um, simply partisan. I think a better example of an of a investigation that produces at least a push for impeachment would be Trump's second impeachment where um, he was accused of inciting insurrection in the Capitol. And that was the most um, bipartisan impeachment vote in the Senate that there ever has been. So uh, how do you fix it? What's the next mechanism? Um, fix what? Specifically, are you the referring problem, to uh, the problems that you cited with the process? How do you make it less partisan? I think uh, that would be first looking into the partisan nature of our country. Initially, the framers were looking for there to be multiple factions. This can be seen within Federalist 10, and to rather identify with ideas rather than political parties that we have today. And the fact that we are a two party system definitely concurs and just makes it even worse. So perhaps to have a third party rise to prominence, whether that's Libertarian or Green Party, would definitely be beneficial. And this could be advantageous if there wasn't as much gerrymandering, or perhaps if primaries, the people who were uh, voting within these primaries weren't the most extreme. And if more people voted within primaries, it'd be less extreme candidates and then therefore less extreme polarization. Um, another way to fix the, the scale of overtly partisan investigations that we've been experiencing. I think there's a direct correlation between um, congressmen and women relying on lobbyists for their information versus their congressional staffers. Um, so I believe that more funding towards the CRS uh, to increase the number of staffers that uh, work and find research for each committee would, instead of giving um, biased information that our legislation is based on, it would give um, simple research and neutral um, facts for the legislation to be based on and would eliminate, at least to some extent, um, the scale of the partisan investigations that we're experiencing. The media also contributes a lot to this because the, I mean, ultimately the goal of mainstream media is to make a profit. And so they're looking for clicks and views. And so with in investigations, while they're not, you know, I mean, most people wouldn't consider them necessarily always the most entertaining thing to watch. Um, it gives politicians a platform to use investigations to kind of further their own position versus legislate effectively. So you don't think the media plays a role in disseminating the information that's about an investigation or oversight that's happening? They're not all, you're saying that they're always a party to it? I would say the media does at some points, um, is able to launch investigations to the public, but it's the delivery of whether or not they're partisan or not and it's the delivery of them choosing sides. For example, Sinclair is a pretty predominant news or a prevalent news network that we have. And so it's within not only the national scope, but many local news networks. So by having a prevalent um, company for our news, that could definitely influence voters and influence citizens and their opinions if there's not a diversified area where they can find their knowledge. So I'm trying to, to, to make the disconnect here that the media is influencing the people, but the uh, Congress isn't listening to the people they are listening to lobbyists. Um, so in that sense, what difference does it make what the media is saying? So uh, our congressmen and women are directly elected by the citizens in their districts or in their states. And um, when they are elected, when they are serving on committees, they're receiving their information mainly from lobbyists because they are so understaffed. Um, this can be attributed to, in the 1990s, we had a shrinking government moment where the CRS uh, received, can I finish my thought? 
Um, the CRS received um, or a significant cut to their funding, and therefore the amount of staffers that serve on each congressional committee was significantly um, minimized, and we haven't since okay. recovered. End of the sentence there. We have the time flag. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but you, we were close to finishing the whole idea, but we had a couple of time. So, good job. Let's spend a little time with some feedback. Are you ready for that? Molly, you wanna go first? Okay, so overall, good job. Um, I thought you had a good historical examples, uh, good modern day examples. I would like to see your reasoning um, for your beliefs tied more into maybe what um, tied into what a, um, sorry guys, I'm, I'm too early for me. Just have a little bit more background or have a little bit more to cite towards your reasoning. I believe this because of this principle, because this expert says this, because studies have shown X, Y, Z. I just need a little bit more backup on where you get, um, walk me through how you get to your answer. Um, and I, I did, I thought your point about political theatrics and, and the partisanship nature was well taken and um, overall good job. Ed? Um, thank you. Uh, and I, um... I found a couple of um, a couple of your comments interesting that I wrote down. Um, you talked about certain investigations being a waste of time, uh, and I was um, I was impressed with your um, with your thinking regarding um, financing and uh, increased congressional staff. Uh, I thought that that was uh, an interesting solution because what I was looking for is um, is solutions to uh, the problem uh, and the issues of partisanship. Uh, a couple of places um, that uh, you went with that, I think, um, were good, but I, I was really looking for more of a, you know, a catalog of bullet points of here's what we would do to fix it. You gave us some of those, and I thought they were very very interesting. Um, and I think the media issue is also intriguing and one that um, I will think some more about. So thank you. Okay, now I wrote down five different things. Let's talk about them. Um, three people that you brought up that I thought were really important, Robert Morris, uh, John Locke, uh, you really put some foundation there along with uh, the Federalist 10 with respect to factioning, which uh, I was just rereading last night <laughs> because uh, somebody else brought it up yesterday. And you said something at the start that intrigued me that these, these, these powers were sort of the least celebrated powers. But then you proceeded to cite a bunch of examples that we've all been talking about for a long period of time. So maybe they're more celebrated than we think. You, know, you, did, a, you did a good job citing those. And in, fa in fact, I like the fact that you took a stance on 9-11, the banking industry, Libya, Ukraine, and you just decided, hey, uh, these worked and these didn't. Uh, and, and I guess that's our role as the public, isn't it? To do that. Um, I guess I was unaware of how much cuts happened to Congress. And that was, that helped me understand the notion of oversight a little more clearly. Uh, so I'll have to do some of my own homework to find out what, what that was all about. And then you put a thing in there uh, about part that this process is partisan by nature. And I would be curious how your generation would want to solve some of that and say, listen, we're doing oversight and investigations. They're not meant to be partisan. They're meant to be evidentiary. And we should make a decision based on what we see. Uh, that was a good notion that you brought up. So all in all, I thought you did a very good job. And thank you for your, being in school on Sunday morning. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I'd like to congratulate the students on their effort and participation this morning. I'll end the recording.